Genghis Khan has been described as a brilliant military strategist and a brutal military leader, known for his ability to unite and discipline the disparate Mongol tribes. And yet, he was also one of the richest humans in history, an incredibly shrewd and ruthless military commander who can cut a mind blowing 12 million square miles of land, more than anyone else in history. He was also known for his brutality, like when the Sultan of Khorizm dynasty killed Mongol straight and Genghis's ambassador. Genghis Khan invaded the Khwarezm dynasty, sweeping through every major city and raising them to the ground, destroying the cities as well as killing anybody including women and children, thus ending the Khwarezm dynasty forever. And yet, Genghis Khan was also considered as the great statesman who valued peace and prosperity as much as conquest. His inventions brought law and order to white swathes of lands which had for centuries been ruled by brutal warlords. And his prohibition of blood feuds forced a lasting peace and an end to the petty conflict which saw constant warfare between clans and villages. However, Genghis Khan was technically considered by historians as the richest human to ever live. You see, when Genghis Khan conquered these different kingdoms, he also took their wealth and possessions, which combined with the value of land that he took, will arguably have been worth trillions of dollars, or in other words, incomprehensibly large amount that's difficult to even quantify. It was an extremely brutal way to build your fortune, but it was certainly effective. And yet, it is hard to deny that Genghis Khan is one of the greatest warlord stories there ever was. His father was poisoned by a rival tribe when Genghis Khan was only 9 years old, and Genghis himself was once captured and enslaved by a rival tribe. However, Genghis's military pro strategic brilliance and ability to lead and unite the Mongol tribes into a formidable force have earned him a place among the most accomplished warlords in human history. So, Genghis's rise from nothing to unimaginable wealth and power is truly fascinating. Let's now travel back in time to the early 12th century and see where it all began. Genghis Khan was born at the time of conflict. At that time, dozens of nomadic tribes in Central Asia were constantly fighting and stealing from each other. It's reported that during this time, Genghis's mother had been kidnapped by his father and was forced to marry Genghis's father. Genghis Khan was possibly born in the year 1162, near the border between modern Mongolia and Siberia. But before the birth of Genghis Khan, his father had captured a Tatar chieftain from a rival tribe, which he became loyal to Genghis' father. So, because of his loyalty, Genghis' father loved him and even liked the name of the chieftain, Temujin. And so, soon after the birth of Genghis Khan, he was originally named Temujin. Genghis was born a member of the Bojikan tribe and was a descendant of the fabled Kabu Khan, who had done what so few Mongols ever managed to do. Unite the many disparate tribes against the Jin dynasty of China six decades earlier. Greatness marked Genghis from birth not just in the heritage of his mighty bloodline, but physically with a literal mark caused by a blood clot in his hand. During Genghis' birth, he came into the world clothing a blood clot in his right hand. And to the superstitious Mongols, this meant that Genghis Khan was destined to become a great leader. Young Genghis though will have a hard education in survival ahead of him amidst the various clans that met of the Mongol lands. When he was just 9 years old, his father took him to live with the family of his future bride and on their way back home they encountered members of a rival tribe but this time around they are not there for a conflict and instead they invited Genghis's father home with them to share in a conciliatory meal. Believing that the rival tribe members meant to bury the hatred over past aggression, Genghis's father agreed to visit their home because this is what he always dreamed of, ending the conflict between the rival tribes and live in peace and unity. And so he agreed to dine with them. Unfortunately for the young Genghis, this is the last time he will ever see his father alive. The food they gave to his father was poisoned because they believed that it is the only way for them to get rid of him. And so 
he died as a result of the poison. When Genghis learned about his father's death, he immediately returned home to claim his position as a clan chief. However, the rest of the clan refused to accept the leadership of a nine-year-old boy, and as a result, his family was deserted by his own tribe, becoming near refugees in their own tribe. Genghis bought revenge and to never be laughed at again. This led him to quarreling with his half-brother after a dispute, and as a result, Genghis killed him and confirmed his position as the head of the family. The young chieftain was still a child and had already learned the brutal reality of Mongol life. Power is won by blood spile. However, when Genghis turned 16, he married the woman he had long ago been promised to, a young girl by the name of Boche. This marriage cemented the alliance between her tribe and his, but soon after the wedding, Genghis's wife was kidnapped by a rival tribe and given to their chieftain as a wife. Genghis launched a daring rescue along with his close friend Jamuka and his older protector Togrul. They did the rival tribe's camp and rescued his bride. However, when she gave birth to a son nine months later, named Jochi, they were doubt about who the real father was. But to everyone's surprise, Genghis accepted young Jochi as his own son, daring any of his rivals to question his judgment. Eventually, Genghis will have four sons with Bote and an unknown number of daughters. Though during the course of his rule, he will take many other wives and have many other children with them, but Bote alone will remain his lifelong companion and only his male children with her will qualify for succession in the family. However, Genghis was captured in a raid by a tribe that had formerly been his family's allies, the Taichud. Genghis was enslaved briefly, though his iron will will prove difficult to break and he was punished several times for refusing to submit. With the help of a sympathetic captor who perhaps still held some loyalty to Genghis' family, and as a result, Genghis was able to escape. And from that moment, Genghis Khan promised himself to be extremely powerful so that he will never be captured or enslaved by any rival tribe ever again. After Genghis Khan had successfully escaped from captivity, he began making alliances, building a reputation as a warrior, and attracting a growing number of followers. He formed a fighting unit out of his brothers and some of his most trusted clansmen, believing that his people will never truly become great until they cease the pity in fighting. And with the rivalries between the various, Genghis took his small force out into the steppes and began to unite the clans together one by one. His goal was simple. He would destroy all the division between his people, those louder if he had to, and the Mongols would at last become one people, a mighty nation to rival the powers of China. Young Genghis's small force would swell to an elite fighting force of 20,000 battle-hardened warriors. A brilliant tactical mind combined with the savage brutality Genghis proved an exceptional battlefield commander, and his final force met its first true challenge when Genghis turned his army on the Tatars, who had murdered his father so long ago. When he successfully defeated the Tatars, Genghis then ordered as punishment that every Tatar male who was taller than the exit pin of a wagon wheel to be killed, ensuring that only children who could be molded to be obedient to the young Khan would be left alive. With one Benjian satisfied, Genghis turned next to the Taichud, the former family allies who had attempted to enslave him. Relying on an army of expert horsemen, his cavalry routed the Taichi's forces and as a revenge, Genghis had every single Taichi chief boiled alive. A few years later, he would go on to defeat the powerful Naiman tribe, who stood between Genghis and his ambition of a unified Mongolia. Their defeat will give the young Genghis control over the central and eastern Mongolia. After finishing his mission of uniting the Mongols, Genghis Khan was now in full control of their territories. He's got more territory than any Khan had held in centuries. Genghis was a shrewd battlefield commander who combined expert tactical thinking with ruthless brutality. And yet, he was also keenly aware of the value of military intelligence. He employed a huge number of spies, which he sent out among his enemies to learn the strength and weakness of those he faced. 
Sometimes his spies also acted as assassins, eliminating important rival military commanders and thus weakening the effectiveness of the fighting forces that opposed him. He was also quick to adapt new technologies from those he defeated, and this will include improved bows which allow his men to shoot further and more accurately, as well as techniques for quickly relaying messages between his forces. Most famously, Genghis adopted a system of smoke and burning torches to relay long distance commands, as well as large drums and flags to give signals in the midst of combat. This allowed Genghis to issue commands to his forces even at the midst of the field, making them incredibly mobile and able to respond to an evolving battle. Often outmaneuvering an enemy, Genghis' great military success also relied heavily on the individual expertise of his soldiers. Unlike most ancient commanders, Genghis did not accept just anyone into his fighting forces. He ensured that each man who rode into battle with him was an expert rider who could handle and ride a horse without a saddle. His soldiers had to be an expert marksman with a bow, but also be able to fight in close quarters with swords and daggers when needed. Typically, the average Mongol carried a bow, arrows, a shield made of wood or leather. They could also carry javelins, body armor made of hardened leathers, and a lance with a hook in order to pull enemies off their own horses. As expert riders, each of Genghis' soldiers could handle their horse with just their legs, leaving their hands free to shoot a bow or wield a lance and shield in combat. Yet, as a chain tactician, Genghis recognized that an army was more than just fighting men at the front. Thus, his armies were also followed by a very well-organized supply system of ox carts, loaded with supplies and extra military equipment, shamans to provide spiritual leadership, maintain moral and train the wounded, and even government officials whose job was to catalog the plunder. After his initial victories over the major Mongol tribes, the other tribes unified and agreed to make peace with him. At last, Beson opened Genghis the title of Khan, or in other words, Universal Ruler, a title of not just political but also spiritual importance. A great shaman declared that Genghis Khan was the living representative of Monche Koko Tengri, or the eternal blue sky, who was the supreme god of the Mongols. With his newfound divine status, it was clear to him that his destiny was to rule over the world. Genghis immediately led his forces to fresh conquest, striking out in 1207 against the kingdom of Shishia, which had flourished in northwest China since 1000 AD. The Mongol leader Genghis Khan commanded some initial raid against Xi before launching a full-scale invasion in 1209. This marked both the first major invasion conducted by Genghis as well as the first major Mongol invasion of China. After a nearly year-long siege of the capital Yezhuan, although the diverted river accidentally flooded the Mongol camp, the Tangut Emperor Lian Quan surrendered unconditionally and Genghis turned his attention against the Jin dynasty in northern China in an epic struggle that would last for 20 years. Yet, even as he fought for control of China, Genghis' armies also struck out the West. He established diplomatic relations with the Khwarezm dynasty, a Turkish empire that included Turkestan, Persia, and Afghanistan. But relations quickly soured when the Mongol diplomatic mission was attacked by the governor of Otra, a prosperous and important city. When the 450 strong Mughal trade caravan arrived at the city, the governor in Al Shuk accused the traders and ambassadors of being Mongol spies and he executed the entire caravan. Genghis Khan sent a delegation of three diplomats to the Khwarezm Sultan, demanding that in Al Shuk should be punished for the murders. But instead, the Sultan beheaded the lead ambassador and shaved the beards of the older two sending them back to Genghis with the lead ambassador's head. However, this will prove to be a mistake. In 1219, Genghis Khan personally led an army of 200,000 Mongols against the Khwarezm dynasty, sweeping through every major city and raising them to the ground, destroying the city as well as killing anybody including women and children. Anybody who wasn't immediately slaughtered was forced to march in front of the army to act as human shield as Genghis led a siege to the next city, 
Genghis spread no living in the empire, killing everything from children to small domestic animals and even livestock. Two years later, in 1221, the Sultan was captured and killed, but his son fled and would later raise an army to fight against the Mongolia and Genghis Khan. After a deadly war took place between the Mongols and the Sultan, the Mongols once again outnumbered his army and before they get to him, he fled away and from there on he was nowhere to be found. The Mongols captured and killed the rest of the army and thus ending the Khwarezm dynasty forever. The invention of the Khwarezm dynasty brought Genghis Khan and his horde to Eastern Europe and began an age known as the Pax Mongolica. The Pax Mongolica brought a period of stability among the people who lived in the conquered territory. Despite being known as brutal war leader, Genghis Khan was also a great statesman. In valued peace and prosperity as much as conquest, his invention brought law and order to white swathes of lands which had for centuries been ruled by brutal warlords. And his prohibition of blood feuds forced a lasting peace and an end to the petty conflict which saw constant warfare between clans and villages. Genghis's law also forbade adultery, theft, and false witnesses, reflecting the Mongols' great respect for the environment, making it the law for people to treat their natural resources with great respect. Decency was made a part of a soldier's life, as much as obedience, and soldiers were taught to pick up anything that the soldier they were following dropped. Unity was preached over traditional selfishness, and Genghis's laws helped weave together the many desperate people under his great empire. A stunning aggressive leader for his time, Genghis also outlawed the tradition of earning promotion in either the military or in government, solely due to hereditary or ethnicity, and instead made it law that only merit will be used to judge the worthiness of a man. In Genghis Khan empire, a non-Mongol had as much chance to rise in the ranks as a Mongol, and an efficiency and competence were valued over social status. Genghis Khan's empire also gave tax exemptions to religious organizations, something that would take centuries to be adopted by Western powers. There was also a great degree of religious tolerance, reflecting the long-held Mongol tradition of religion as a personal conviction, free from the law and interference. Genghis Khan even established a mail system in which you will see packages and letters safely delivered from as far as Europe all the way to the coast of China. A wonder which could not be repeated again for centuries. By 1227, Khan had conquered much of Central Asia and made incursions into Eastern Europe, Persia and India. His great empire stretches from Central Russia down to the Aral Sea in the west and from the northern China down to Beijing in the east. After suffering injuries sustained in battles, the fearsome Mongol leader Genghis Khan succumbed to a disease and died in 1227. Upon his death, he held an estimated 12 million square miles of land more than anyone else in history. The Mongolian Empire continued to grow after Genghis Khan's death, eventually encompassing most of inhabitable Eurasia. The empire disintegrated in the 14th century, but the rulers of many Asian states claimed descended from Genghis Khan and his captains. Even though Genghis Khan might technically be the richest human to ever live, after conquering 12 million square miles of land between 1206 and his death in 1227. However, because historians can't quite agree on how to compare wealth from so many centuries ago, that means the title of the richest person ever is still up for debate. However, do you know that there is someone who is considered by many historians as the richest human to ever live? If you want to know why historians consider him as the richest person ever, click here to watch our documentary on the untold story of the richest human to ever live. But for now, all that's left for us to say is thank you for watching this video to the end. You are the true heroes and see you in the next video.